Okay, testing one, two, three. Hopefully everybody can hear me. If not, then I need the sub to make sure that the switch is on to the left of my computer monitor and turn up the volume so it is hearable. First things first, you have a test next week. Test number five will be our last test of the semester. It will be on Wednesday and Thursday of next week, so I will be with you on Monday and Tuesday before we take that test. I will grade those quickly and have them back to you on Friday, a schedule, so that you have all of the tests for the semester to study for the final exam. If you don't have all the tests, see me. I have a few leftovers in my box, um, but you might need to take a picture of a friend's test. Okay, quick little recap. Please do not write any of this down. Just want to finish off Genesis in the next couple of days and give you an overview of what's in it. Genesis starts with the two creation stories, um, part of what we call the proto-history or prehistorical stuff. There's the story of creation by the priestly author Elohim, is the God name in chapter 1, and then the second story of creation by the Yahwist author in chapter 2. That's followed by the fall of Adam and Eve, the story of Cain and Abel, and a long genealogy. Uh, what follows after that is the Noah story, or the two Noah stories which have been woven together into one narrative. Um, that is then followed by the Tower of Babel. And interesting, the Tower of Babel, the sin of the people, is trying to be equal to God, building this tower thinking they don't need God. And it's the same kind of hubris that was at the root of um, the people eating the fruit in the first creation story. I don't need to obey God. I can be God. Um, and then that's followed by the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which we will talk about um, next week. The stories that we've been doing the last few days and you have been doing online over Christmas vacation and during the snow time are the stories of the mothers and fathers of ancient Israel. And again, these stories are legendary, but probably have some historical basis. There had to be an Abraham who moved away from mono or polytheism and began moving towards monotheism. Again, don't write this stuff down. Just an overview here. We have the stories of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar in Genesis 11 through 19. We have the stories of Isaac and Rebekah, kind of brief stories in chapters 20 through 24. The Jacob, Rachel, and Leah stories are chapters 25 through 38. And then what we're going to talk a lot about today is the Joseph narrative, which takes up the last 10 chapters of Genesis. So again, don't need to write any of that down. Turn to the uh, picture you have or the notes you have on the family tree of Abraham in your notebook. And I'm going to run through this very quickly. I assume that you actually have pretty detailed notes on everybody. Um, Abraham has a wife, Sarah, or Sarai, who is suffering from barren wife syndrome. She suggests that he solve their fertility problem by taking a concubine, and that is the Egyptian slave Hagar. Hagar becomes the mother of Ishmael, and through Ishmael, Abraham becomes the patriarch of the Muslim people and the Arab peoples, um, while Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and the rest become the mothers and fathers of Judaism and Christianity. Um, Sarah, as I mentioned, suffering from barren wife syndrome, does have a baby, um, Isaac. Isaac gets married to Rebecca, and lo and behold, Rebecca is also suffering from barren wife syndrome. But fortunately, this is the Bible, so anybody who's got this condition is going to have a miracle child. And in the case of Rebecca, she actually has twins. The twins are Esau and Jacob. You should have some detailed notes about these two brothers. Just as Isaac, the second son, has conflict with Ishmael, the firstborn son, and eventually overcomes him, same thing happens with Jacob and Esau. 
Esau trades away his birthright as firstborn in exchange for a bowl of soup. And Jacob later, with Rebekah's help, actually tricks Isaac into giving him Esau's blessing. We didn't go through that in any detail, but again, the idea of the younger son triumphing over the older son is in many of these biblical narratives. And Esau comes home after Isaac has given Jacob the blessing, and he wants to kill Jacob. And Rebekah tells Jacob that he should get out of the house and maybe go back to the old country of Mesopotamia and find a wife. And so that leads us then to Jacob getting married to Rachel and Leah. Um, again, a little switcheroo on his wedding night. He thought he was marrying Rachel, and instead he ends up marrying Leah. He works seven years for Rachel, and the father says, well, work another seven years. I'll give you both daughters in exchange. So Jacob and this two sisters he, are, he is married to, and they're two porcupines, I mean uh, concubines, generate 12 different sons <clears throat> who then become the patriarchs or the namesake for the 12 tribes of Israel. Oh, by the way, Rachel was suffering from barren wife syndrome as well. There's going to be some activities at the end of this video connected to the 12 sons and connected to Joseph. But for now, I'm just going to leave this um, family tree right here. I can give you more details later on. But basically, all the people on this map, on this family tree, plus a few more, are going to be on the family tree on the test. And there will be descriptions of them. So you should have some notes on who these people are and what they each do. Okay, moving right along. Um, oh, by the way, Jacob meets his wife at the well, the same place where Abraham's servant found a wife for Isaac. That's also where Moses is going to find his wife. Uh, Israel, we'll talk about that later, and move to the next slide. Come on, machine. Okay, the Joseph narrative. Here you should turn to a fresh page in your notes, and you're going to want to jot some of these things down. What moves the Joseph narrative along is a cycle, a cycle of three, uh, three cycles of two dreams. First, there's the dreams that Joseph has about sheaves of wheat bowing down to him, 11 sheaves of wheat, or 11 stars bowing down to him, and the sun and the moon bowing down to him. The next cycle of dreams are the dreams that the Pharaoh's servants have when they're in prison with Joseph. One has a dream about some grapes and a grapevine, and another one has a dream about some bread. And then the third cycle of dreams are the dreams that Pharaoh has. First, a dream about seven fat cows being eaten by seven skinny cows and then seven withered grains of corn, replacing seven full grains of corn. And these dreams move the story along. Uh, the first series of dreams, the sheaves and the stars, Joseph is imagining his brothers bowing down to him, and even his mother and father bowing down to him. And what happens because of those dreams, you'll want to jot these down, is that Joseph gets sold into slavery in Egypt. There's actually two different versions of Joseph being sold to slavery. One is some Ishmaelites pull him out of a um, cistern, and the other one is that some uh, Midianites buy him from the brothers. Doesn't really matter. In both stories, he ends up in Egypt. The second cycle of dreams, Joseph is in prison after being falsely accused of rape. And Joseph meets two servants of Pharaoh while he's in prison. He interprets their dreams for them. You're going to have your head raised up. You're going to get your job back. And you're going to have your head raised up. You're going to be impaled. And because Joseph interprets dreams for these two servants of Pharaoh, 
he is eventually brought into, jo into Pharaoh's presence when Pharaoh has some dreams. And then the third cycle of dreams are kind of the most important ones because they predict that Egypt and the whole world, I'm making air quotes, the whole world are going to suffer a famine, and that leads Egypt to prepare for a famine, and Joseph is put in control. So again, in each of these stories, the dreams drive the story along. Uh, and Joseph himself in the story says, well, the dreams come from God, and I'm just interpreting what God has shared. Now, the dreams come from God, but human free will is at work in the dreams as well. And I would like you to jot down something in the story that shows that free will is at work. Just write it somewhere in your notes, an example of free will. Where somebody's doing something, not because God's making them do it, but because free will is is still present. The ones I see are the brothers plotting against Joseph, Potiphar's wife lusting after Joseph and falsely accusing him, and Pharaoh selecting Joseph as his assistant. Sorry if that doesn't show up on the screen. The story is geared to show you that God's at work in human history, that God has a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, and there's a famine coming, and so God's trying to save them from the famine. So here's another recap, and this one's important to jot down the first part of this. In the Bible, the story of Joseph shows God at work in human history, God's presence sending these dreams to Joseph and to the servants and to Pharaoh. It also shows God kind of stepping back and allowing human free will to work. God's transcendence. God's not just picking up the Israelites and moving them to Egypt and building a subdivision for them. There has to be human work in this as well. And then God is trying to save Jacob's family because of the covenant. That's the meat of the story, that the end of Genesis, the last ten chapters of Genesis, are the story of how God is involved in human history, but not micromanaging the universe. There's another version of the Joseph story, and here I want you to think about the story of the boy who cried wolf and how I change the story and I change the message. Or think about the story of Noah and the ark and how that was the Gilgamesh flood story and it was changed, and in changing the story, they changed the message. There's going to be several questions on the test talking about how stories are ways in which we communicate a message, and that if you change a story enough, you can actually change the message. So make sure you have these things written in your notes as well. And what we're going to do next is listen to a different version of the Joseph story and talk about what the message is that the author is trying to communicate uh, in this work. So I'm going to pause it right here.